So hello everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you today to the online SPICE SPIN Plus X seminar. So this is a joint undertaking between the SPICE uh, Interdisciplinary Center, Spintronics Interdisciplinary Center in Mainz, which is headed by Hiro Sinova and with Karin eva Schositte, and the Collaborative Research Center SPIN Plus X, which is headed by Martin Eschelmann, Burkhard Hillebrands, and myself. So we have uh, talks every Wednesday at uh, 3 p.m. German time, both on um, Zoom as well on the YouTube channel, which is organized by Robert. And um, just uh, in addition to the talk today, I'd just like to announce that the talk uh, next week is going to be given by Claire Donnelly from the University of Cambridge on three-dimensional magnetic systems, the future is bright. So firstly, I'd uh, at this point also uh, give a big hand to Jairo, who has been really instrumental in setting this up. So he's not here today, so I'm standing in for him. And uh, yeah, but he did, was very instrumental in setting this up. And uh, it's good that we have this uh, lecture series online going on. Um, and with that, I come to the speaker this week, or today, which is Arne Bratas. So um, Arne is originally from Norway. Um, and he did a PhD at Trondheim and then uh, was a postdoc in Delft and at Harvard University. And since 2002, he is professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, NTNU, in Trondheim. Um, and his research interests are on the theory of spin transport and dynamics in insulating and conducting nanostructured materials, which part of it he's going to present today. And he also has received a number of accolades, honors, and awards. So so um, uh, between 2013 and 2019, he's been the chairman of the Kavli Prize Committee in Nanosciences. He got an ERC Advance Grant in 2015. And since 2017, he's the director of the Center for Quantum Spintronics, QSPIN at NTNU, where I've had the pleasure to collaborate with him quite intensively. Um, also, um, this is held as a webinar, meaning that uh, you'll not be allowed to speak um, initially. But if you have a question, you can raise, use the raise hand feature on Zoom, and then I will promote you to be able to ask a question. Usually, we have the lecture running until the end, and then we ask questions at the very end. Also, you are very feel free to ask any questions in the chat. Uh, in particular, if your microphone is not working, just put a question in the chat, which then I'm going to read out to Arne at the end. Okay, so um, thanks everyone again for joining. It looks like a good crowd, good turnout today. And with that, I'll hand to Arne for his presentation. Can you see my slides? Yeah, looks perfect. Great. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for the um, introduction and uh, for inviting me to virtually come to Mainz on this online seminar. I am at the Center for Quantum Spintronics, which is in Trondheim in Norway at the, universe, at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. And as you can see on this slide, uh, we have quite an active campus despite the um, coronavirus. Um, uh, everything is more or less working as normal with regards uh, to research, but not for the students. So they are mostly at home uh, listening to lectures. Normally, um, I hope uh, that you can come to uh, our center at some point and visit our seminar room and maybe give seminars. And this is where we normally are. But um, at present, you can see that I'm uh, out by the fjords in Norway. At least the uh, background picture looks like I'm there. Actually, I'm at home, uh, which is the norm these days. I'm going to talk about noise. And uh, noise is very often um, problematic because it um, destroys the signals that we would like to observe, or it uh, disturbs um, the features or the phenomena that we would like to see. Uh, it might uh, distract us and lead us to other conclusions than what we would like to know. Uh, but as you know, uh, there's also often features hidden in the noise. And that's what I'm gonna talk about, that um, in magnetic systems, we can find out more about the system by measuring the noise. And specifically, I'm gonna talk about one kind of noise, which is shot noise. But first I will um, remind you about 
noise in electrical conductors. So if you have a conductor uh, which has a resistance R, there's also a conductance G, which is in the inverse of resistance, and the conductor is um, placed in between two reservoirs, then when the system is at equilibrium, the average current is zero, the charge current is zero, but nevertheless, the current fluctuates. And these fluctuations at the equilibrium are described as johnson nyquist noise, and they're determined by the fluctuation dissipation theorem, which means that the, the amount of low frequency noise is uh, fully determined by the conductance of the device and the firmly, thermal energy in the system. So you have that the fluctuations are proportional to the thermal energy and the conductance. This picture somewhat changes when you bias the system. If you put the voltage bias between the left and the right hand side of this device, because then there is a net current flowing from the left to the right, but also there can be enhanced noise if the bias voltage is larger than the typical thermal energy. And this noise depends on the properties of this conductor. So let's say that we have a simple conductor with only one conducting channel that's determined by some um, transmission probability T. Then in that case, two things can happen. One thing is this electron might be reflected as I just shown you. The other is that the electron can be transmitted to this device. So there is some uh, uncertainty about what happens within this conductor. And this uncertainty due to the Pauli exclusion uh, principle is what gives rise to this shot noise. The shot noise is zero if the probability is either zero or one, because then it's certain that the electron either will be reflected or transmitted through the device. But the shot noise attains its maximum when the probability is somewhere in between zero and one, typically, let's say one half in this case. And if you have many channels, then you can generalize this and you just sum over all the conducting channels and you can find out what this shot noise is for this conductor. And this shot noise reveals several aspects of the electron transport in this device. It can tell you, uh, because this is now under the condition that transport is phase coherent. So first of all, it can tell you if transport is phase coherent or not. It can also tell you the charge of the carrier because um, that's a discrete unit of each um, conducting channel. And it can tell you the distribution of the probabilities for this conductor. Uh, this I copied from a review by Beinecker and Schoenenberger a long time ago in Physics Today. And this is an example of how the distribution of these transmission eigenvalues in some systems. Uh, and the ratio that you get between the shot noise and the typical current. Uh, for some conductors, it is not so that the transmission is either very small or very large. Actually, it can be uh, both. It can be um, bimodal distribution. And this can be seen. This is an example of a diffusive conductor. This can be seen then in this so-called Fana factor, which is the ratio between the shot noise and this um, net current. Also, you can measure the charge, the effective charge that passes through this conductor. And a famous, famous example is in the case of fractional quantum Hall effect, where you can see from the ratio between the shot noise and the net current that the net charge that passes through the conductor is less than uh, E. It's uh, E divided by three in this case. So the shot noise reveals properties of the conductor. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is um, what this might reveal about magnetic systems when we put that in contact with uh, normal metals. So what I have in mind is that we have a magnet. And this magnet can be a ferromagnet. So we can have a magnetization, a net magnetic moment. But it can also be an antiferromagnet where there's no net magnetic moment. But nevertheless, there is an order parameter that describes the staggered field in that case. And this order parameter, which is the staggered field for the antiferromagnet or the magnetization for the ferromagnet, can persist in time. And that gives rise to additional noise. It can give rise to additional thermal noise 
but it can also give rise to additional shot noise. And I'm going to talk uh, mostly about this additional shot noise that it gives rise to. So if you put this, met this magnet now in contact with uh, normal metal conductors to the left and right, there can be fluctuations of the charge current through this device, even in the absence of a, absence of a voltage bias between the left and the right. And these fluctuations are driven by the magnetization dynamics or the spin dynamics in the general case. These properties of, this, uh, of the shot noise and noise are also related to other phenomena that are of a large interest um, for the large um, 20 years or so. And one of them is spin pumping. Spin pumping is the feature that if you uh, dynamically set the spins in a magnetic system in motion, and if that system is in contact with the metal, then you will pump spin currents into the normal metal as a result of the dynamical precession of the spins in the magnet. This was realized already in the 70s by Silsby, Chanassi, Monod, Herdequint, and Berger, who developed a phenomenological fra framework for describing this spin pumping from the magnetic systems into the normal metal. And more recently, I was involved in um, a, making a more quanti quantitative prediction of how large of a spin current you can get from the um, ferromagnet that's dynamically pumping spins into the metal. And I'll describe that now because it serves as the background to the other features that I will discuss. So let's now assume that I have a ferromagnet that's on the right in this slide. And the ferromagnet uh, has a magnetization that processes in time. So it goes around the equilibrium orientation. And then on the left-hand side, I have a normal metal where all the states are filled up to the Fermi energy. Now I imagine that I look at only one electron inside this normal metal, which has a spin pointing up. And I would like to know what happens to this electron as it moves from the normal metal towards the uh, ferromagnet. And what happens is that as this moves towards the ferromagnet, when it goes into the ferromagnet, it experiences the uh, um, that the magnetization changes its orientation in time. So it can gain an energy h bar omega. Omega is now the precession frequency. And it can flip its spin and come back to the normal metal. This produces, this phenomena produces no electrical charge current because there was an electron coming from the normal metal and it was returning to normal metal. So the net charge current is zero, but the spin current is not zero because what happened was that the spin direction was flipped inside the ferromagnet before it came back. That's why we get spin pumping because in this process, we produce a net current from the ferromagnet to the normal metal. We can also then estimate how large the spin current is. Um, and first of all, in general, this spin current can be shown to be determined by a property known as the mixing conductance, which is the transverse conductance of the contact between the normal metal and the ferromagnet. And it's determined by the rate of change of the magnetization. But in the extreme precession limit, if I now assume that the magnetization really rotates in the xy plane, one can find the magnitude of this uh, spin current and the result is that the spin current is then polarized along the z direction, which is along the static orientation of magnetization. It's determined by h bar divided by a half, which is the spin angular momentum per electron, and the number of transverse wave guide modes, because that's the number of modes that can pass between the metal and the ferromagnet in the simplest case. And it's driven by the bias, which in this case is the um, excitation energy. And this all comes from this very simple picture that um, you create, uh, that you uh, flip one spin at a time and it gains an energy h bar omega. This phenomena is, um, has several consequences. First, if I have a, an isolated ferromagnet, 
Then the uh, dynamics of the magnetization is determined by the lambda lifshitz gilbert equation. So the rate of change of the magnetization is determined by the effective field, which is set by magnetic anisotropies and dipole energies and exchange energies. Then there is a damping coefficient, the Gilbert coefficient alpha naught, determined by the rate of change of the magnetization. And then there are also fluctuating fields. And the fluctuations in H naught are related to the dissipation uh, determined by alpha naught by the fluctuation dissipation theorem. If I now have a ferromagnet in contact with an ore metal, because of this spin pumping, the, the um, Gilbert damping gets enhanced. So it becomes the uh, intrinsic damping within the ferromagnet plus an additional term that's determined by the, um, by the contact to the, between the normal metal and the ferromagnet by this transverse mixing conductance. This property is uh, proportional to the cross section between the normal metal and the ferromagnet and inversely proportional to the volume of the ferromagnet. Therefore, it's typically a one or a thickness depends. But on top of that, the spin current fluctuates. It's not um, a steady current. There are also fluctuations, which means that the fluctuations, if I now put the ferromagnet in contact with the normal metal, there will also be enhanced fluctuations for these um, inside here, which means that the H naught also becomes bigger as compared to a single ferromagnet. And it turns out that the enhancement of the fluctuations are exactly related to the um, uh, enhancement due to spin pumping, again, by the fluctuation dissipation theorem, if you like, but you can also calculate this explicitly by just looking at the fluctuations of the spin current in this device, which means that the effect of putting a normal metal in contact with the ferromagnet is twofold. One is that the Gilbert damping is enhanced, and the other is that the fluctuations are enhanced. Now, what I'm going to talk about is um, not the enhancement of the spin currents, but I'm going to talk about charge currents that fluctuates. And this is uh, partially inspired by a recent work by these authors. And they considered the case of a, um, a ferromagnet that precesses, that's in the middle here, which is in, in their case was in tunnel contact with some normal metals outside. And they computed the charge current fluctuations. In this case, not the spin current fluctuations, but the charge current fluctuations. And they found uh, this expression for the charge current noise. The first term, is like thermal noise, it's proportional to the thermal energy. But the second term is a more interesting one. And in the limit that the um, excitation frequency is large, this resembles shot noise driven by the um, excitations. And in their case, these two coefficients are related to each other in the case of a tunnel contact. There is also another work uh, earlier than the one I just shown that developed a more general framework, also in the case of a tunnel contact between two ferromagnets to look at the fluctuations of currents and the spins and the magnetization dynamics. And in the extreme cases of either very low temperature or high temperatures, they get similar results as the work that I just shown. What's interesting about this setup and what's, what I think is novel about it is that it's a new way to detect and characterize ferromagnet resonance in magnetic structures in conducting systems. And also a new way to uh, see possibly new features of electron transport in magnetic nanostructures. And this electric charge noise exists even in the absence of spin orbit interaction. So it does not require any spin to charge conversion such as the spin hall effect or the inverse spin hall effect. So the effect is rather robust in that sense. What I will describe is a generalization of this to, which is valid not just for tunnel contact, which was studied before, 
but it's valid for any contact that you may have between the metal and um, the normal metal and the ferromagnet, including ballistic junctions, diffuser junctions, and tunnel junctions. Because we know from the past for the shot noise in electron transport that the ratio between the shot noise and the current and the ratio between the shot noise and the johnson nyquist squares is different for these different junctions. So it's interesting to see what this difference might be in the case of um, magnetic systems. And furthermore, it's also I also gen generalized this to describe not just ferromagnets, but also the case of antiferromagnets, because we know that antiferromagnets have also interesting properties that sometimes are uh, somewhat different than the case of ferromagnets with features that, um, for instance, the frequencies are much higher and also the dynamics might be richer in antiferromagnets than it is in ferromagnets. And finally, the, um, the results also apply to multi-thermal devices. So one can imagine to measure cross correlations of currents in several contexts. So the system that I have in mind is schematically looking something like this. Uh, we have several reservoirs uh, that we, where we may put the, the voltage at zero uh, or we might have a finite voltage. We have several leads that is con our contacts to a conducting material. And this conducting material contains a magnet with a processing order parameter. And what we would like to know is uh, what the current fluctuations are in these different contexts when the order parameter processes, uh, either in the case of a ferromagnet or in the case of an antiferromagnet. And we would like to know um, how this, this noise, this additional noise, this shot noise now depends on the dynamics of this magnetic material and how it depends on the transport properties that connects this material to the reservoirs and also the properties of the material itself. And the way I've done this is to use uh, scattering formalism, which is known as the Landau formalism for electron transport, but then in the time dependent um, uh, generalization. And I'm not gonna tell the details of the duration. If you're interested in that, you can look up in the paper, but I'm instead I'm gonna explain the main results and the physics that is involved in the main results. In the Landau formalism, what you do is to um, uh, describe electron transport in terms of uh, the scattering properties that connects the different reservoirs. So you have, for instance, a scattering matrix where there are reflection coefficients between the right reservoirs and between the left reservoirs and there are transmission coefficients between the left and right, in this case for a two thermal device. For instance, you can calculate then the conductance in this device, which is proportional to the transmission probability between the left and right, or between the right and left, that's equal in this case. Now I'll explain why there are, why there, why there is noise in the system. And the noise in the system, even in the absence of a bias, arises because of three features. One is spin pumping. When the magnet processes, it pumps, spins to the surrounding uh, normal metals. And there are fluctuations in the amount of spins that's being pumped to the surrounding medium. This spin pumping gives rise to spin accumulation and a fluctuation in the spin accumulation in the surrounding normal metals. In turn, the spin accumulation in those surrounding metals can give rise to a charge current because if the, uh, because, because the transport properties of the ferromagnet are spin polarized, which means that you can have a spin to charge conversion by means of the giant magnet resistance effect. And because the um, dynamics is dynamic because it depends on time, then the spin accumulation that you generated at one time is not necessarily only transfers to the, spin, to the magnetization or the order parameter at another time. Therefore, you can get uh, fluctuations in the charge current in the system, even though there is no charge bias within it. 
So the first is spin transfer and spin pumping. So this is a picture of spin transfer and spin pumping. If I now look at the right-hand side of this um, figure, this illustrates spin pumping. So in spin pumping, a magnon, which is a excitation in the ferromagnet, in the case of ferromagnet, gives rise to um, the a scattering between, a, in this case, a spin down electron to a spin up electron in the normal metal, and therefore can generate a spin accumulation inside the normal metal. In turn, if I now look at the ferromagnet in contact with the normal metal, let's imagine now that I generated a spin accumulation inside the normal metal, which means that the chemical potential for a spin up electron is different than the one for a spin down electron. And in this case, I assume that I have equal amounts for enhanced population for spin up electrons as compared to spin down electrons. This spin accumulation will drive a charge current through this ferromagnet uh, because the electron transport properties are different for spin up and spin down electrons. So the difference in the um, chemical potentials, the spin accumulation, simply drives the charge current through this ferromagnet. So that's why from a fluctuations in this spin accumulation, we can get fluctuations in the charge current. What are the experimental consequences of these um, fluctuations? When can we see them? That's interesting from an experimental point of view. Well, the low temperature shot noise induced by the magnetization can directly be observed as long as the excitation energy is bigger than the thermal energy. And in the case of ferromagnets, the typical excitation frequency is up to the order of 100 gigahertz which translates to a temperature of the order of one Kelvin. So that means that in order to observe shot noise in ferromagnets, we would have to cool down the material um, down to one Kelvin or less to see this clearly. In antiferromagnets, um, it's in principle somewhat easier to observe shot noise because the typical excitation frequencies are much higher. It can be of the order one terahertz or even bigger which translates into a temperature of 10 Kelvin, which means that you can observe uh, the shot noise directly at um, larger temperatures in antiferromagnets than in ferromagnets. But even if you are, if you're not able to reach those low temperatures, even at higher temperatures, there will be features from the shot noise, although somewhat suppressed, but they can be distinguished from the thermal noise because they have a different frequency dependence because the thermal noise is white noise. It has no frequency dependence. Whereas the shot noise, as I'll discuss in more detail, is enhanced exactly at resonance with of the ferromagnet or the antiferromagnet. So by looking at the frequency dependence, you can separate the two contributions and you can possibly observe it even at higher temperatures than these um, strict criteria. So what are we after? What we are after, is the uh, are the current fluctuations in this system. So we would like to know the correlations between the uh, deviation of the current from the equilibrium current. And uh, in the case of an equilibrium system, the equilibrium current is zero. So these subindices labels leads, and there are different time, um, uh, we measure the deviations at different times. Uh, I would like to know the low frequency noise, meaning the um, low frequency Fourier transform of the relative time difference between these noise. And we now assume that we have a drive that's periodic with some period T. So we also average this over that time. Turns out that there are two contributions to this noise. One is the thermal noise in general, and the other one is the shot noise. And these two contributions add up in the system. And I'll now describe these two properties and how they, um, they look like. First, we have the johnson nyquist noise, which is thermal noise, which, uh, which is the trivial part, which is what you have in any junction. And in terms of the uh, scattering theory, you can find in general that the thermal noise is determined by the 
for uh, many terminal configuration. These now labels the terminals is determined by the conductance matrix for the whole system and the thermal energy in the whole system. And these conductance matrices are just the conductance matrices that you can find from the lando bittige formula uh, for two different spin directions for spin up uh, properties and for spin down properties. So these are just in the simplest case, the transmission probability for spin up electron and the one for spin down electron. And so for this thermal noise, there's really nothing, um, no new phenomena, which just means that the um, uh, theory can also capture those in a consistent way. The more interesting thing is the shot noise, how that is, how that looks like in the general case. And it turns out that in the general case, one can find out the shot noise, that is the shot noise contribution to the um, conductance fluctuations so of the charge current, consists of three factors. And I'll try and try to describe each one of them. Uh, the first factor is what's something I call the spin dynamics factor. It's a factor that only depends on the spin dynamics of the magnet. It only depends on how the spins process in the ferromagnet or in the antiferromagnet. It does not depend on the electron transport properties as such. Then there is a factor that describes the crossover between shot noise and thermal uh, suppressed noise, which depends on the excitation frequency of the external drive and the thermal energy. So that's also a generic factor. And finally, the most interesting part is the prefactors that determines the magnitude of this shot noise. And these prefactors are electron transport coefficients, just like the um, uh, shot noise properties that if you remember were proportional to T1 minus T, these factors will be generalizations of that in the case of magnetic systems for magnetization dynamics driven shot noise. So the main new result is this shot noise that has three terms as I just described. And really the main um, property here are these coefficients, these shot noise coefficients that it turns out that in the case that you assume that uh, spin is conserved in the system, meaning that um, there is weak spin orbit interaction in the system, then you can calculate this in terms of the scattering matrices for spin up and spin down electrons. And what you will find then is that these properties are determined by the combination of spin up and spin down coefficients, not just the spin up by itself and the spin down, but combinations of that. And the reason why you have combinations of spin up and spin down properties in each one of the coefficients is that this electric noise is determined by the pumping of the spins, which is always transverse to the magnetization direction. And something that's always transverse to the magnetization dynamics has to be a linear combination of spin up and spin down properties. So that's why you always get the linear combination of spin down and spin up properties. Another feature is that there are four the, such scattering matrices here, which means that it's a two electron property, just like in the correction to the shot noise for electron transport, where you have this T one minus T property. So the last term is T squared. Here, there's also something that's quadratic in the reflection and transmission um, coefficients. Then the spin dynamics factor is only determined by the uh, deviation of the order parameter from equilibrium. So this d o omega is given by the transverse components of the order parameter, let's say n, which I can classify as uh, in terms of x and y or plus and minus, or if you drive this by some external transverse fields, let's say plus and minus, you can determine this in terms of suscept magnetic susceptibilities of the device. So this means that you can measure the shot noise in terms of something that's related to the transport properties and something that's only related to the magnetization dynamics. And you can measure these properties independently as well because you can measure the magnetization dynamics properties 
independently in FMR or in AFMR. At low temperatures, then the shot noise dominates and the shot noise will then be proportional to the uh, excitation frequency and the spin dynamics factor. At higher temperatures, as I discussed, the shot noise is suppressed, but nevertheless, you can possibly observe if the temperature is not too high because of the unique uh, frequency dependence of the spin dynamics factor. And I'll now describe this um, uh, spin dynamics factor. The spin dynamics factor is determined by the susceptibility of the device, of the magnetic device. And, the, um, and it's driven by the transverse magnetic field. So if I now have uh, the case of a ferromagnet, then I can imagine that I have transverse magnetic fields, that's omega h perpendicular, that drives the magnetization dynamics then this spin dynamics factor will be proportional to the square of that transverse field. It can be resonantly enhanced. And if I consider now the case of uniaxial anisotropy, then it, there will be a resonance enhancement if the frequency of the drive equals this uniaxial anisotropy. And there's a broadening due to Gilbert damping that so that the, uh, the spin dynamics factor uh, never approaches infinity, but it's cut off uh, when omega approaches omega a. So at resonance, the magnitude of this factor is typically proportional to the um, transverse field squared, and it's inversely proportional to the anisotropy field and the Gilbert damping coefficient squared. That's the magnitude of this field. Similarly, we can discuss, we can find out what this um, spin dynamics factor is in the case of an anti ferromagnet. It's quite similar, but although there are some slight small differences. Also in that case, it will be proportional to the um, transverse driving field, the square of that. It will be enhanced at resonance. So omega r is the AFMR resonance frequency. And this is also the case in the case of an um, uniaxial antiferromagnet. You can also find results for other kinds of antiferromagnets. And there is some broadening because of Gilbert damping, also in the case of um, an antiferromagnet. And in the case of an antiferromagnet, one can find that at resonance, this factor equals the squared of the transverse field and is inversely proportional to the um, exchange energy and the squared of the um, Gilbert damping coefficient. Now I will return to these shot noise coefficients and explain a little more features about these coefficients because those are the ones that determine the magnitude of the um, shot noise and also the ones that will reveal uh, properties of the magnetic conductors. So as we saw in the many thermal um, case, they can be turned by uh, some scattering matrices that is totally describe this uh, device. But let's now consider the case of a two terminal expression. So when you have two terminals, left and right, then we can find the shot noise coefficients in terms of the reflection and transmission coefficients for this two terminal device. And again, we see that it always comes in combinations of spin up and spin down coefficients. And it's a two particle properties because it's the product of two of these. Then we can calculate what this is in the case of um, simple junctions. First, in the case of a ballistic junction, if we now assume that all the conducting channels are either open or closed, then we will find that in the case of a ferromagnet, the um, shot noise parameter is determined by the number, n is the number of conducting channels and the polarization of these channels, the difference in the number of conducting channels or spin up and spin down electrons. In the case of an antiferromagnet, if the junction is ballistic and in the semi-classical limit, uh, there is no difference between the number of spin up and spin down electrons uh, that can go through this channel because they see the same potential landscape, although it's shifted by one unit self. But for the um, overall probabilities, 
that does not matter for this property. So it turns out that the shot noise parameter in that case is actually zero in the semi-classical limit. In the case of disordered junctions, if you assume that the disorder is such that the potential landscape is completely different for spin up and spin down electrons, then one can find simple results for these such shot noise coefficients. And it turns out to be determined by the conductances for spin up and spin down uh, electrons. And there's some small corrections if the conductances are, are um, um, large compared to the showering conductance. But otherwise, this correction is small. And similar in case of the antiferromagnet, if you then assume that the potential landscape for spin up electrons is different than the one for statistically in different than the one for spin down electrons. And in those cases, we can find a very simple result that these two shot noise coefficients are equal and it's just determined by the conductance of the device. And it turns out that this is actually the same as the result for the tunnel junctions that I presented earlier in earlier works. So to conclude, um, what I've tried to tell you is that one can find general expressions for the noise driven by magnetic resonance um, that can characterize and detect magnetic resonance and electron transport in a slightly new way because there are different coefficients involved and it will reveal more about the transport properties than what you can find from the current by itself, and also what you can find from spin pumping and spin transfer torques. There are thermal and shot noise contributions to this, and the most interesting one is the shot noise contributions, because that's the one that reveals the characters of the junctions. And this shot noise attains its maximum at magnetic resonance, and the coefficient differs for various junctions. And if you would like to see more, then you're welcome to look at the details of the derivations that I did not go through here, because that's rather mathematical, but instead I tried to explain the main results. And you can go into that paper if you'd like to see more details of that. And with that, I would like to close by showing you a picture of the um, inner city of our town. <laughs>